Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is 6 p.m. and I'd like to thank you all for arriving on time for the opening ceremony of the Caribbean World of Work Forum. My first task is to beg your indulgence because there is a lot of traffic on the road and we would like to request that we start in another 10 minutes to allow some of the other folks who are en route to arrive. So I'm seeing some noddings of heads. So thank you very much and we will start in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your patience. As our first order of business, I invite you to listen to the safety briefing of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Welcome to the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. You are located at the CLR James Auditorium. There are no planned drinks today. In the event of an emergency, you will hear an alarm. Once the alarm is heard, please proceed to the nearest exit, either to the right of the stage or to the back of the auditorium. Once outside, please assemble at the open playing field where you will receive further directions from the college's emergency response team. Washrooms are located to the right of the stairs as you exit the auditorium or to the left of this stage. Be reminded that this is a no smoking facility and do enjoy your stay at the college. Thank you very much. May I invite you now to stand for the playing of the national anthem of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, then remain standing for a prayer. Please join me in reciting the Credit Union Prayer, also known as the Prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be loved as to love, to be understood as to understand. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. You may now be seated. Thank you very much. Our program dean, Mr. Colin Bartholomew, for reciting the Credit Union Prayer. Professor Brian Copeland, Chairman of the Board of Governors, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Dr. Vincent Henry, Director, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Ms. Karina Coburn, Country Representative for the Inter-American Development Bank, Trinidad and Tobago. Ms. Natalie Willis. Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Labor. Members of the Board of Governors, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies. Mr. Josiah Austin, Chairman, Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation. Ms. Vera Goseva, Senior Specialist, Workers' Activities, ILO. Presenters and moderators of the Caribbean World of Work Forum. 
Executive Management, Faculty and Staff CCLCS. Specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yemi and it is a pleasure for me to serve as your Master of Ceremonies for the opening of the Caribbean World of Work Forum 2023. With your welcome address, I invite CCLCS Chairman Professor Brian Copeland to the podium. Thank you, thank you. Madam Master of Ceremonies, Mistress. You have to be so careful these days, right? Thanks. I think I'll go to the formalities, if you don't mind, um, and say good afternoon to Dr. Henry Vincent Henry, who's director at CCLCS, and a special welcome to Ms. Karina Coburn, country representative for the Inter-American Development Bank, and our keynote speaker. I'd like to thank you for agreeing to, to do that, Ms. Coburn. Ms. Natalie Willis, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Labor, members of the Board of Governors of this um, illustrious college, Mr. Josiah Austin, Chairman of the Tunapuna Piauco Regional Corporation, Ms. Vera Guseva, uh, Senior Specialist Worker, uh, Workers Activities, ILO, presenters and moderators of the Caribbean World of Work Forum, Executive Management, Faculty and Staff of CCLCS, and Specially Invited Guests, and any members of the media who are here today, uh, welcome. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's formal launch of the Caribbean World of Work Forum for 2023. I extend special greetings to our international visitors who are here in person, and those of you who are joining us online. At this 2023 installation of the Caribbean World of Work Forum, we have presenters and participants from all of the English-speaking countries in the region and from Suriname and St. Martin. We also have presenters and participants from Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, and North and South America. And I do believe the only con continent not represented here is Antarctica, with its all of 1,000 transient people. But this is the third edition of the forum. We at CCLCS are proud of the fact that we are progressively carving out a space, a very unique space, as the only multidisciplinary conference that explores issues related to the world of work in the Caribbean. In 2019, when we inaugurated the conference, the theme was wealth, productivity, and social protection, and we all met in person. In 2021, we met online as the COVID-19 was transitioning from pandemic to its endemic stage. Our theme then was reimagining the new normal. We never got to the normal stage, right? This year, it is good that some of us can meet in person. Despite all the advances in technology, in communication technology in particular, there is as yet no replacement for the social capital that comes from a well-structured in-person meeting. Whereas corporate trainer, where, sorry, as corporate trainer Paul Axtell commented to the Washington Post, albeit it was in an advertorial, and he wrote a book called Meetings Matter. So we take him as an expert, and he said, it's much easier to ask for attentive listening and presence, which creates the psychological safety that people need to sense in order to engage and participate fully. Now our theme for 2023 is disruption, resilience, and just transitions. Our conference themes are clear markers of the dynamics of the world of work and give a good sense of the challenges we face in Caribbean social and economic development. Since we last met, for example, public consciousness has been assailed by the reality of artificial intelligence. As an educational institution, we have been grappling with its implications for teaching and learning. As an institution with a mandate and vision, a mission, to focus on the world of work, we have also been inquiring into its implications for working people. We have come to realize that while disruptions have traditionally been discrete and, and acute events, we are now increasingly assuming the characteristic of being continuous and chronic. 
Now our interactions over the next two days will support the college's attempt to make a contribution to the advancement of social justice and the general development of national and Caribbean society through the provision of accessible, world-class, certified, competency-based education and evidence-based knowledge products in the fields of worker advancement and welfare. Our commitment to finding solutions are consistent with the ILO Declaration on Social Justice for a Fair Globalization, which recognizes that the fundamental values of freedom, of human dignity, of social justice, of security and non-discrimination are essential for sustainable economic and social development and efficiency, and that, in, and that individuals can develop and update the necessary capacities and skills they need to enable them to be productively occupied for their personal fulfillment and common well-being. Now in reading this, friends, I was reminded of a 2014 paper in a journal called the Ecological Economics Journal, and it was an article by three authors, that's uh, Motesa, if I pronounce this correctly, Motishari, Rivas, and Kalne, that referenced historical evidence and used a formulated model to conclude, and I'm quoting them, that either one of the two features apparent in historical societal collapses, and they mentioned those two, over-exploitation of natural resources and strong economic stratification, difference between rich and poor. Either of those two can independently result in a complete societal collapse. Given economic stratification, collapse is very difficult to avoid and requires major policy changes, including, and this is the hard part, major reductions in inequality, for sure, and population growth rates. That's their conclusion from their analysis. And my question is, has this not been a mantra of many a concerned individual over the years? And does this not speak to the importance of discussions such as the ones we're about to hold? And these discussions will be channeled through four interconnected and reinforming streams. The first stream is called disruptions and, dis and uh, responses in the world of work. In this stream, we will be examining how disruptions are affecting the dynamics of the workplace, including issues related to mental and physical health and wellness. The second stream, governance, labor, administration systems, and equity in the world of work. Well, here, the focus will be on the adequacy of systems to protect workers and the vulnerable to promote equity and fairness. The third stream, which is called the social and solidarity econ economic uh, framework, key to resilience. This stream will explore opportunities for economic self-determination and the requirements for creating an ecosystem that supports the mobilization of community assets and wealth creation. And finally, the fourth stream, workers' voice and the discontents of globalization. Stream four recognizes the unequal power dynamics of the international economic system and explores the need for strong voice consistent with the fundamental right of freedom of association and collective bargaining. Colleagues, I wouldn't delay. I just wanted to say I'm very pleased at the work that this college and its team has done to bring together such a rich intellectual feast. The review of our list of presenters shows an excellent combination of activists, practitioners, and, and academics, representatives of the labor movement, government, and private sector, practitioners of industrial relations, and practitioners of human resource management. It is a tremendous opportunity for us to listen to each other and to learn from each other. It's an opportunity to start moving for implementation on the ideas that come forward. I'm grateful then to all our presenters and moderators who have willingly given up their time and expertise to share with us and look forward to a very uh, rewarding two days. I thank you for your attention and I wish you all success in the next two days. Let's come up with some plans for moving our societies forward. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Copeland, for setting the tone and sharing the outline for the forum over the next two days. To help ease that process, I invite you to learn of the logistics from fellow Miss Sangeeta Barrett. Sangeeta? Pleasant evening, distinguished guests. Welcome to the Caribbean World of Work Forum. As we continue with our program, we would like to take a moment to provide you with some important logistical information to ensure that you have a seamless experience during the conference days. For our in-person delegates, one of the key points to consider is navigating your way through the conference venue. To assist you in locating your sessions, we have implemented detailed signage throughout the premises. However, it's essential to be aware of the following. As Professor Copeland would have stated, there are four streams for the conference. Stream one will take place in the CLR James Auditorium. Stream two will take place on the first floor of the East Wing that's upstairs rooms 201 and 202. Stream three will be on the first floor as well, rooms 204 and 203. Lastly, stream four will be held in rooms 104 and 105 on the ground floor of the East Wing. Each session per stream has been assigned specific rooms. You can also find this information in your conference program with session locate locations listed under the respective stream names. For registration and the collection of conference materials, please proceed to the foyer area located directly below the auditorium. Registration will remain open today until the conclusion of the opening ceremony and will also be available during the days of the working sessions. Should you have any questions or require any assistance at any point during the conference, our support staff at this location would be readily available to assist you. Moving to the west wing of the college, which is situated to the far left, um, to my far left, you will find dedicated rooms for dining. These classrooms are situated on the ground floor in rooms 107 through 109. For your convenience, there will be a vendor on site providing meals throughout the conference days for purchase. They can be located in the school's cafeteria, which is located at the northern side of the college. We have support staff positioned at various points throughout this, the venue, easily identified by their badges. They are here to assist you with any inquiries, provide directions, or offer any additional information you may require. For our online participants, please note that Zoom events would be the platform used to stream the conference virtually. After completing your registration through our online form, you should have received an email from a no reply Zoom events address containing your ticket information. Please ensure that you log into the Zoom events using the same email address to which your ticket details were sent. For an optimal experience, we highly recommend using a desktop or laptop in conjunction with the Zoom app. We have also prepared various resources to assist you in navigating the Zoom events platform addressing frequently asked questions, and providing general guidelines for our conference. You can access these resources on our college's website at cclcs.edu.tt. We hope this information helps you navigate the conference smoothly. Should you need any further assistance or have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to our dedicated support staff by calling 1-868-609-3064, extension 624, or email cwf at cclcs.edu.tt. 
These details can also be found on the college's website. Thank you for your time, and let's make this conference a resounding success. Thank you very much, Sangeeta, for the details. So as you all just heard, if you have questions, check your conference programs, check the support staff, check the registration desk, and for those of you online, you can check the website. Excellent. And at this point, we are going to take a little breath out as we invite some musical entertainment for you. I would like to call to the stage the Xavier Strings to give a musical presentation. Ladies.
Good evening. Is it even evening? What time is it? <laughs> Has it been a full long day for you all as well? Yes. You all enjoying yourselves? Yes. You all doing good work? Hmm. You weren't sure about the good work part. All right. <laughs> well, we're Xavier Strings. I'm Janelle Xavier. That's Janine Xavier Cross. And we're here to give you a few beautiful selections from across the Caribbean. We want to remind each other Remind everyone to love one another with a little vice versa love. And we're going to need the microphone. The microphone for that. The microphone on the stand for that. Thanks so much. <laughs> and just a small technical announcement. Um, don't stand possibly in front of the the window there is blocking the wireless signal. Thanks so much. <laughs> technical things, technical things. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yes, oh, you'll hear me as well over here? Lovely. Yeah, you can. Okay, a little vice versa, vice versa love. Thank you. 
everybody we want vice versa love to all the hungry and vice versa love to all the rich and yeah. vice versa love come on and get it vice versa love we want vice versa love what do we want we want vice versa love. Vice versa love. We want the vice versa love. Please welcome it. Come on again. All right, come on. Vice versa love. Vice 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 love. Wait, wait, wait. Vice versa love. Vice versa love. Yeah, yes. Ah! Vice versa love. <laughs> I think I just got out class on the stage. Come on and get it. Everybody. and everything Woo. love it enjoy that i cannot get that back up there so i'm going to leave that here and we leave you all with our last one for the evening enjoy a bit of soca
Let's have another round of applause for Xavier Strings. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janelle and Janine, for raising our spirits and getting us ready to listen keenly to our keynote address. To discuss redefining labor market roles in the new work order, let us welcome country representative of the Inter-American Development Bank, Ms. Karina Coburn, to the podium. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to try my best not to drop the energy level in the room. <laughs> I didn't realize I would have to sing for my supper before even starting the speech. So first of all, I really would like to thank Dr. Henry for extending this challenge to me. It's always a pleasure to be here at, at the Cipriani College. I think that the work that's being done there, done here is particularly important as we look forward to what I will call the new work order, which is just another way of talking about the future of work. So I'm going to ask that all protocols be observed and move right into it with a pleasant good evening to all distinguished guests. The labor movement in the Caribbean enjoys a rich and powerful history. Evolving with close linkages to campaigns for social justice, the right to vote, self-government, independence, and regional integration, the movement often spanned racial lines culminating in an unstoppable force for change during the immediate pre- and post-colonial era. In fact, Captain Arthur Andrew Cipriani, for whom the venerable institution in which we stand is named, was himself a leader of both the Soldier and Sailors Union, representing ex-servicemen after the Great War, and later the head of the Trinidad Working Men's Association, which included both working class Afro and Indo Trinidadians. The TWA eventually birthed the Trinidad Labor Party in 1934, Trinidad's first political party, with Captain Cipriani remaining active in political life in various roles, including Port of Spain City Councilor, Mayor of Port of Spain, and representative to the Trinidad and Tobago Legislative Council in the period up until his death in 1945. Such was his impact that at the unveiling of a statue in his honor in 1959, then Nationalist Movement, sorry, then Chief Minister Eric Williams opined Captain Cipriani is a pioneer of the nationalist movement of Trinidad and Tobago. With the unveiling of this statue, we commemorate our own historical development, our own positive action, our own native history made by native hands, and the aspiration of our native peoples. The Cipriani College of Labor, founded in 1966, was also named after Captain Cipriani, with the name change to the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies, completed 30 years later in 1996. Interestingly, 2023 marks 100 years since Captain Cipriani was elected president of the Trinidad Working Men's Association in 1923. And if he were somehow able to survey the labor landscape of today, what would he see? Well, first of all, there are no doubt a lot more women in leadership positions. <laughs> and of course, he would see everyone, both young and old, typing on some strange electrical devices from morning to night. 
There have also been huge changes in production facilities and tools. The 40-hour work week was introduced. There are flexible work arrangements and paid vacations, maternity leave, and sick leave, as well as medical plans and pension plans to which both workers and employers contribute. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, there is a diverse workforce. Nationals are captains of industry and of the government, and there is a generally higher standard of living for most of the population than obtained in 1923. And what of industrial relations? Were he here just over two weeks ago, Captain Cipriani would have witnessed the widespread cancellation of flights by Caribbean Airlines when most of their pilots called in sick. Apparently, we are told, this took place within the context of an impasse in the wage negotiations between Cal and its pilots. After an application by Cal, the industrial court granted an emergency injunction barring members of the TNT Airline Pilots Association from engaging in industrial action and directed that TALPA instruct its members to return to work. Subsequently, it was announced that the Ministry of Labor is to convene a meeting between the parties. Meanwhile, in other jurisdictions where there is reportedly a widespread pilot shortage, earlier in 2023, Delta Airlines inked what has been described by Reuters as an industry-changing pilot contract that offers US $7 billion in higher pay and benefits. Most of Delta's pilots are represented by the Airline Pilot Association. American Airlines, United Airlines, and Southwest Airlines were all in the middle of contract negotiations with their pilots at the time that deal was finalized. By August, American Airlines announced that their pilots, 15,000 of whom are represented by the Allied Pilots Association, had ratified a new four-year agreement with the company, which will deliver more than US $9 billion of compensation and quality of life benefits. This after sporadic protests by Delta pilots throughout 2022 and by various groups of AA pilots in 2023. Now, while we at the IDB express no opinion on any of these protest actions or agreements, what is clear is that there is still an important role for worker representatives and indeed other actors in today's labor market and industrial relations context even though the workforce and work arrangements differ significantly from what they were 100 years ago. So what does worker representation look like and what should it look like in 2023? And is it still important to have effective worker representation? Let us consider the case of monopsonies. Only 90 years ago in 1933, just a short time ago, the economist Joan Robinson described what she called monopsony theory in her book, The Economics of Imperfect Competition. In monopsony, there is one dominant power in the buying relationship with little competition from other buyers. This allows buyers to set the price lower than otherwise would obtain in a more competitive market. In a labor market, a monopsony can be a potential cause of labor market failure where a dominant employer has wage setting power over potential employees and may end up paying less than optimal wages for the worker and employing fewer workers. In many cases, 
it may suit those employers to operate at a lower equilibrium of wages and quantity of workers than in a more competitive market, thereby contributing to possible losses in equity and economic growth. At the time, Robinson was attempting to explain the wage gap between women and men workers. But today, perhaps a monopsony could explain the behavior of labor markets in which government is the largest employer, or the relationship between firms and workers in the gig economy, for example, Uber and its drivers, or cases in which certain firms have become almost ubiquitous and have reportedly been paying only minimum wage with very long working hours. Amazon or Walmart are entities that readily come to mind in this debate. Even when monopsonies are not present, various other factors can contribute to an imbalance of power between employers and workers. For instance, there could be information asymmetries or legal frameworks and requirements which limit specialization of labor, either of which could tilt negotiating power in favor of, of employers and place workers at a disadvantage. Effective worker representation can help empower workers within the labor market to lower inequities and enhance economic outcomes. But who should provide this representation? Traditional collective bargaining through a union like Delta and AA pilots have done could be one avenue. Another is for workers to self-organize. Let me share a story of, um, that recently made headlines in the US about the self-organization of migrant workers making food deliveries in New York City during the pandemic. With help from grassroots organizations, these migrant workers promoted a landmark slate of bills, ultimately approved by the New York City Council, which included essential, essential regulations for equitable labor practices. By working together, they secured the right for delivery workers to use restaurant restrooms and demanded transparency in the way the algorithms in delivery apps determine tips and wages. With tech firms still pushing for these workers to remain classified as independent contractors, they continue to lobby for greater protections such as weight restrictions on deliveries in a single trip and to allow workers to set maximum distances for orders without penalty. These workers who often deliver for DoorDash, Uber Eats, and other delivery apps by bike, operate in the gig economy I mentioned briefly earlier, which as you may already know, refers to the workforce of people involved in freelance or side hustle work. Many of us were involved in this, I'm sure, before it was called the gig economy. <laughs> but in any case, the gig economy is undoubtedly here to stay. As with the example of the food delivery drivers in New York City, where NGOs and legislators supported their campaign for change, workers' efforts alone will most likely not be sufficient to ensure improved labor market outcomes. Indeed, there are several actors who can positively contribute to effective worker representation and collaborate to champion more efficient and equitable labor practices. Indeed, if we consider worker representation in its broadest sense, the state, employers, civil society, and workers themselves each have a role to play in creating an environment in which workers' rights are respected, productivity can increase, and the economy can flourish. There is a clear role for the state in the design and enforcement of equitable labor laws and regulations, 
and the provision of social safety nets, such as employment benefits and health care. But policies outside the labor realm can also help develop a more inclusive and dynamic labor market. In other words, non-labor policies can have an important impact on labor market equality and help expand the productive workforce. For instance, prejudice-reducing educational policies, such as debiasing interventions in schools, can help curtail discrimination in the workplace in the long run. And subsidized childcare policies can help mothers stay in the labor force and narrow the gender pay gap. Even public transfer, transportation policies can have an important role in, in inclusion. Evidence from cities, cities in Latin America like Lima and Medellin show that infrastructure investments which make it more convenient and safer to use public trans transportation can have important positive labor market impacts for women. In Trinidad and Tobago, we can envision a more intentional utilization of labor-related stakeholder inputs in the development of policies and legislation, especially those that may not immediately seem to be directly linked to labor. Fortunately, the country is not short of trained professionals who can contribute to this dialogue including, I'm sure, the alumni of this institution. These discussions could even include secondary stakeholders such as the industrial court, judiciary, central statistical office, the TTE police service, and others, thereby allowing for a holistic and an informed approach to policy making. For example, the IDB has been collaborating with law enforcement agencies in the Caribbean to improve the effectiveness of gender-based violence policing. By enabling survivors to regain their confidence and independence through counseling, protection, and support in the pursuit of justice, they are empowered to pursue training and employment opportunities ultimately increasing female participation in the labor market. When access to quality jobs expands and labor markets become more inclusive, poverty, informality, and citizen security indicators are positively impacted. Turning to the role of employers, we would expect that a responsible employer complies with labor laws and regulations, like providing a safe working environment and paying over amounts deducted for taxes and benefits. Moving beyond the letter of the law, many employers have also found it beneficial to provide training and development opportunities that enhance employees' skills and contribute to their well-being. In fact, research from the University of Warwick in the UK has found that happy employees are up to 12% more productive based on a study of over 700 participants in four controlled experiments. Other employers are working to create an inclusive, diverse workplace environment in order to increase innovation and enhance profitability. In the case of the Casino Group, a French mass retailer, the focus has been on preventing discrimination in hiring practices in order to increase diversity of their workforce. Also, they have invested heavily in studies to identify discriminatory practices within the company. As a result of these efforts, they have been recognized with several French National Diversity and Gender Equality Awards. Other evidence includes research by Deloitte indicating that diverse companies enjoy 2.3 times higher cash flow per employee. A BCG study which found that companies with diverse management teams had a 19% increase in revenue 
compared to their less diverse counterparts. And more diverse companies reporting 19% higher revenue according to the Harvard Business Review. Clearly, it can make good business sense for employers to invest in the welfare of their employees and align with the interests of workers. There doesn't always have to be a disconnect or adversarial approach where power imbalances are exploited. Actually, for smaller firms, allyship with workers can be critical for sustainability and growth by maintaining strong relationships with suppliers and customers and avoiding the high cost of turnover and retraining. Meanwhile, the role of civil society in the labor market is increasing. From a global perspective, the International Labor Organization considers unions and employer associations as non-governmental organizations which form part of its governance and consultative arrangements. At an operational level, the ILO also partners with other NGOs which champion social justice for decent work and undertake programs to achieve goal eight of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, namely decent work and economic growth. One of goal eight's targets is to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, including for young people and persons with disabilities an equal pay for work of equal value by 2030. According to the ILO, decent work is productive work that delivers a fair income, rights, social protection, and supports sustainable economic growth. It is a source of dignity and the foundation of peace, social justice, and greater equality. In many countries, NGOs play an essential role to ensure that vulnerable groups such as migrants and displaced persons, persons with disabilities, and members of certain racial and ethnic groups are able to access decent work. Consider, for example, that according to the 2022 World Migration Report, the total estimated number of migrants that is, people living in a country that is not their country of birth, was 281 million people in 2020. 128 million more than in 1990, and over three times the estimated number in 1970. So though most people in the world continue to live in the country of their birth, the numbers of migrants are growing exponentially. While migrants are not inherently vulnerable, migration does carry risks, especially for certain groups of migrants, such as forcibly displaced persons, who were estimated to number some 108.4 million people by the end of 2022. These risks could include financial loss, social intolerance, lack of access to government services, and of course, the inability to access decent work. NGOs, such as the grassroots community organizations who assisted the food delivery drivers in New York City, intermediary nonprofit organizations of labor lawyers, and NGOs that work with other vulnerable migrants across the world are helping improve access to labor justice raising awareness about labor rights and advocating for policy changes. So far, we have discussed the evolving role of the state, employers, and civil society in a well-functioning labor market and the contribution each can make to improving outcomes for workers, the economy, and the society. And what of the role of workers themselves in representing their own interests? While the ILO notes that trade union membership has been going down over time, 
both in developed and developing countries, workers are still organizing. Though perhaps the nature of organize, organizing may be different these days. Workers at Amazon and at Trader Joe's supermarkets in the US are setting up independent unions or self-organizing. Whereas at Starbucks and Chipotle, employees are teaming up with established unions. That difference aside, the dynamics at play are remarkably similar. Notably, the campaigns are being led by determined young workers. We are witnessing more bottom-up unionizing rather than unionizing being driven by seasoned official union representatives. In many cases, concerned individuals are spearheading the efforts for workplace reform themselves rather than patiently waiting for professional union organizers. Instead, the campaigns have gained momentum organically by workers talking union to each other in the warehouses and coffee shops and reaching out to colleagues in similar entities in the same city and then in other cities until it spreads across states and then nationwide. This approach has especially helped workers in the gig and platform economies in the United States. I explained earlier what the gig economy is. The platform economy involves exchanges between producers and consumers, or buyers and sellers using a digital platform or computer system. So think Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft. From Argentina to Indonesia to Denmark, gig and platform economy workers have been able to use these techniques to organize and address matters such as algorithmic transparency, insurance coverage, and dispute resolution. Globally, traditional labor unions are also making strides to keep up with emerging trends. In a 2023 paper entitled Trade Unions Navigating and Shaping Change, the ILO provides numerous examples of trade unions disrupting their business model by developing innovative online learning platforms for their members. That's happening in Singapore. Launching a Twitter bot to raise public awareness of the extent to which companies are paying female employees less than their male counterparts, also in Singapore conducting foresighting and scenario planning exercises to see how the industries they represent are likely to evolve and strategize accordingly. That's happening in South Africa and Italy. Establishing an online union based on a low fee model for hospitality workers, leveraging an app that provides chatbot enabled advice in Australia and focusing on data protection, so workers have the central role in determining how their data is collected, used, and managed by companies in the UK. And this is far from an exhaustive list. Clearly, there are interesting and innovative approaches led by workers organizing in both traditional and non-traditional ways. Looking ahead to the future of work, or what I'm calling the new work order, to borrow a term used by the Foundation of Young Australians, which produced a very interesting labor market research series by that name, I'll quickly highlight three key considerations which should inform the future role of the key labor market actors we have been discussing. Remember, these were the states, employers, civil society, and workers, each of whom can represent workers' interests in some way and improve outcomes in the labor market. There may very well be other important actors, but I have chosen to focus on these this evening. 
The first consideration I'm going to highlight is gender equality and diversity. According to the IDB publication, The Future of Work in Latin America and the Caribbean, What Will the Labor Market Be Like for Women? Women's participation in the labor market generates greater growth rates and reduces poverty. Estimates for the region project economic growth of up to 6% of GDP per capita, resulting from modest policies that promote female labor market participation, such as expanding quality care services. This is in addition to the multiple additional positive benefits for families and communities, including better nutrition and education for children. Furthermore, companies with the most diverse labor force in leadership positions achieve greater financial returns, between 21 to 33% more than companies in the same field with less diversity. However, women have historically been underrepresented in labor unions. Although this gap has significantly narrowed in many places, such as the US. Starting in 2015, Brazil's largest trade union federation made women central to its bargaining agenda. 50% of seats in its state and national executive boards were reserved for women, and specific demands were made related to gender equity. This approach increased female-centric amenities in collective bargaining agreements. For example, more female managers, longer maternity leaves, longer job protection, with no measurable negative impacts on employment, workers' wages, or firm profits. Similarly, workers in the informal economy and in rural areas have traditionally lacked proper representation in labor organizations. By recognizing these marginalized groups and including their representatives in decision making, there is a higher probability that their rights and responsibilities will be actioned within labor agreements and standards. With this in mind, organizations such as Fair Trade International strive to ensure that rural cocoa producers are better represented in the global trade system. In the most recent Fair Trade Cocoa Standard updates issued in December 2022, producer organizations are required to more effectively implement monitoring and remediation systems to prevent child labor in cocoa production and conduct environmental due diligence. The update also requires sharecroppers and caretaker farmers to have written contracts providing them with tangible benefits and greater visibility. Additionally, the standard indicates that women should have equal access to training and other opportunities. Turning now to consider climate change and its impacts in the new work order. There are likely to be changes in the labor market due to rising temperatures and extreme weather events that disrupt traditional sectors like agriculture, tourism, and outdoor industries. Climate change mitigation policies will also reduce labor demand in hydrocarbon intensive industries or those with a high carbon footprint. Such changes will affect labor demand, potentially leading to job losses or wage reductions. Moreover, increased health risks from heat stress and diseases can also affect workforce productivity. But climate change and the need to transition to green technologies and renewable energy sources will also create job opportunities. For instance, there will be a demand for photovoltaic panel technicians, experts in green transportation systems, urban planners focused on sustainable construction, and experts in ecosystem 
restoration. There will also be business opportunities for entrepreneurs in areas such as resilient infrastructure, climate resilient agriculture, insurance, risk management, disaster preparedness and response, and healthcare resilience. Thus, climate change can have a dual impact, fostering job creation in sectors like sustainable energy while concurrently causing job losses in industries based on fossil fuels. Trade unions and worker movements will be well placed to educate workers about these impacts and to advocate for just transition policies which can help minimize the social costs of the transition to a green economy. These policies could em encompass upskilling and reskilling opportunities for workers facing potential displacement. A third key consideration in the new work order is, of course, digital transformation. According to the Brookings Institution, the rise of the digital economy and the pace at which technological advancements are taking place are having a profound impact on the labor market now and for the foreseeable future. Though this has led to some anxiety among workers and employees, there are numerous benefits which can be embraced even while giving careful attention to the attendant challenges. According to the World Economic Forum, almost 25% of jobs are expected to be disrupted in the next five years, meaning there will be both job creation and job displacement. While automation technologies may replace existing jobs, particularly those involving repetitive or unsafe tasks, it will also lead to the creation of new, higher skill jobs. Human-centered jobs requiring well-developed interpersonal and leadership skills will become more competitive. Thus, soft skills in which humans have a comparative advantage, the power to inspire, connect, care, and lead will definitely be invaluable keystones of the labor market moving forward. The ongoing integration of technology in the working world is another good reason why it is so important for actors in the labor market to become more collaborative than competitive. According to a recent IDB report entitled The Future of Work in Latin America and the Caribbean, what are the trends in post-secondary education? It is estimated that by 2025, 85 million jobs will have been lost in the world due to the adoption of new technologies. But 97 million vacancies will also have been generated that will arise from the relationship between humans, machines, and algorithms. After all, AI doesn't care about anyone's feelings. Or winning power battles, or even coming out on top in negotiations. It will just relentlessly continue to learn and improve based on the data that we provide. For us as human beings to continue to thrive, we are going to have to find ways to expand the range of positive economic outcomes for everyone by reskilling, retooling, including vulnerable groups, maintaining flexibility, and continuing to evolve so that we can coexist with and appropriately leverage technology. Friends, I know some of you are looking a bit sleepy. It's almost at the end. It has been a privilege to share these thoughts with you at an institution dedicated to worker representation, social justice, community development, and labor market cooperation and expansion. As the visionary leader and pioneer that he was, I feel certain that Captain Cipriani would have embraced the opportunity before us 
to leverage all the tools at our disposal to achieve the full economic independence which he and the TWA were seeking for the working people of Trinidad a hundred years ago. A worthy battle which we continue to this day. Like our forefathers, the nationalists, organizers, and political leaders who forged the path to self-determination, I hope that we will remain open to the power of possibility and fearlessly continue to look to the future. Thank you again for the invitation to speak and best wishes for the rest of the conference. Thank you so very much, Ms. Coburn, for bringing history alive, for making connections with the current work environment, highlighting the ongoing role of worker representatives, discussing how non-labor policies can positively impact labor policies. I gotta tell you, I was quite riveted <laughs> sitting, listening, because I felt that Ms. Coburn provided a lot of examples and a lot of statistics to give everyone attending this conference a lot of um, discussion points, right? To come up with policies and ideas and concepts around disruptions, resilience, and just transition. So thank you very, very much for your contribution. Um, So before I get ahead of myself, let me um, invite you to welcome to the podium the person responsible for bringing the vote of thanks, CCLCS Director, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry. Chairman, keynote speaker, distinguished Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, they say rank has its privileges. So I have reserved for myself the privilege to say thanks to those who have contributed to this afternoon's ceremony as well as to what we expect would happen over the next two days. My dear mother had one of her Tobago maxims that ingratitude is worse than witchcraft. So in the absence from our forum because he's out of the country, I would like to start by thanking my minister, the Honorable Stephen McClashy, for his continuing encouragement and his mandate that our college has something to say and should say it loudly. Minister is supported by his permanent secretary, Ms. Natalie Willis, and her staff. Between them, they have been unstinting in providing us with the resources to ensure that we fulfill our mandate. My chairman, the very distinguished and accomplished Professor Brian Copeland, in seven weeks since he has taken up his appointment, he has significantly enhanced the intellectual climate of the institution. I keep wondering, and he's probably tired by now of me saying it, whether he's an engineer with a specialty in control systems or whether he's a sociologist. Brian brings a deep appreciation and sensitivity to the condition and challenges facing Caribbean people and the need for creative thinking to address these issues. We particularly appreciate the respect and the light touch he exercises in providing his guidance. Thank you, sir. My friend, Karina Coburn, is as gracious as she is generous with her time and her talent. When I approached her to, de to deliver the keynote address, we joked that I expected a tour de force. 
and I wondered, Karina, whether you were sitting silently in my office earlier this afternoon when the Deputy General Secretary of the Barbados Workers' Union and the first Vice President of the Caribbean Congress of Labor, uh, Mr. Duane Paul, posed a question that you've answered so clearly. Haven't we wasted enough time? And I think that is the existential issue that those of us who are concerned about social justice need to address. Have we wasted, haven't we wasted enough time addressing petty battles, concerning ourselves with issues that really have very little significance in the context of the challenges that we face in the Caribbean. And Karina did not disappoint. She applied her broad thinking skills, her extensive experience as a development specialist, and like the chairman, her deep understanding and sensitivity to the Caribbean development challenge. I particularly like, and I'm wondering if it's yours, correct me if it's not yours, but it is beautiful, and I think it's something we're gonna use here. I particularly like Karina's phrasing of the new work order. It took me back to my days as a young diplomat when we were talking about the new world order. And indeed, it is that kind of broad lateral thinking that needs to occupy our attention. You would know that Karina addressed the issue from a systems perspective. She's one of those Caribbean thinkers that understand the need to pull the disparate strands together to make sense of the reality and anticipate and plan. Again, thank you so much. I am grateful to our presenters and moderators who have consented to share their talents and insights with us. At CCLCS, we strive to make this a safe place for debate and exchange. Thank you so much. For all our partners, the Ministry of Labor, the International Labor Organization, the Caribbean Congress of Labor, Public Services International, the National Trade Union Center of Trinidad and Tobago, the Unit Trust Corporation of Trinidad and Tobago, Biden PI Cafe Barista, Bermudas, the National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, Angostura, Trinidad and Tobago, we thank you for the investment that you have made. To our decorating team, thanks very much to Ms. Sue Ann Jackson and her team. Clean and elegant is what I will call it. While I am happy to thank our supporters, my greatest satisfaction is to pay tribute to the CCLCS team. Organizing this conference has been a very fulfilling experience as we shared the process as a team. Our teams in academic services, the Elmer Francois Institute, public relations, finance and facilities, thank you for putting your best foot forward. Permit me at great risk to name some names. The Elmer Francois team in the interim led by Sangeeta Barrett, who you heard from uh, this afternoon and including Ingrid Pilgrim and Marissa Paul, you effectively filled the gap. <laughs> Solange, Lauren, and the PR team, thank you so much. Sam, Nayasha, and the internal decorating team, thanks. Clevelon, um, the AV guys, the IT guys, I threatened the IT guys, Chairman. He didn't get it right. I was going to borrow somebody's um, weapon and make short work of them. I want to close on a personal note. We're very happy to have you here. And this is, the rest of this afternoon is going to be the celebration of the birthday of my friend, my brother, my colleague, my former student, my, 
Dr. Marlon Nicholas Anaton. Please, Mr. Marlon, I have to good. <laughs> God bless you. We have some tassa. We have some refreshments. Please do not leave until you take just a, um, Mr. Barry Paris Ram, our head of occupational safety and health, has vetoed my plan to do a chip around the building for health. He said there are speed bumps and he doesn't want anybody to damage themselves. But I think we could find some space to move to the TASA, and I want to encourage all of you who are here um, this afternoon to come back, make sure you come back in person, even if you're following online, to come back in person, because we're gonna have a Friday line, we're gonna have a doubles vendor, and we're gonna have some rum snow cones, and a pan around the next side, and I think I have Barry's permission to do the chip around the, um, the building. God bless you and thanks very much. Thank you very much, Director. And seeing as I'm here, I will invite myself back on Friday. <laughs> um, does this look familiar to anyone? If it looks familiar, come and check me afterwards, please. And our final item on the program, and will we be taking responsibility for the evening chair? Okay. The union song. Who is leading our union song to close? Trevor Johnson. Okay, Mr. Johnson. All right, welcome to, thank you, to sing the union song to close us off this evening. Yeah. Mr. Dumpton. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Comrade Lewis, please come. Yes, we have to stand for this. You can't sit for the union song. Okay. Um, we know we want to get... Come, yeah. Okay, colleagues, comrades. We are just doing the first and last verse of the union song. So you're just going to follow, I'm sure. I don't think we have musical accomp accompaniment. So we're just going to go, yeah, three, four. We meet today in freedom's cause and raise our voices high. We'll join our hands in union strong to battle or to For we are coming, union is be strong. Side by side, we battle on what victory will come. Look, my comrades, see the union battles we've Enforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Hold the fort, for we are coming. Union is be strong. Side by 
by side, we battle on what victory will come. See your members still increasing, hear the bugle blow. By your union, we shall triumph over every foe. Oh, the fort, for we are coming, union is be strong. Side by side, we battle on what victory will come. Fierce and long, fierce and long, the battle rages, but we will not fear. Help will come when help is needed, share my comrades, share. Hold the fort, for we are coming. Union is be strong. Side by side, we battle on what victory will come. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Hold the fort, everyone. That brings us to the end of the formal part of this evening. You have an invitation for refreshment. So do go safely. Have an amazing, productive, fun, fantastic conference for the next two days. Thank you very much.